You know, there are many reasons why people leave their homes to exercise. Some go out because they want to stay in shape. Others because they like sports. And others, like me, because they like to be around people. It may seem strange, but let me explain. During the pandemic, I was alone for a long time. I didn't know what to do. And honestly, I was very afraid to leave my house. Nowadays, I've made several friends, and I'm much more settled in the Big Apple. But friends are not. If there's one thing I enjoy, it's being around people. One of my favorite activities is going for a run in the park. As I run, I take a deep breath and feel the fresh air enter my body. I don't mind hearing cars or that the air is in country. I just run and watch other people go about their lives. I'm just another person running through the square. I'm undetectable, like a supporting character in some movie or an NPC. Until one day, when I became the main character in a horror movie. I was running like every day until I noticed some girl running behind me. At first I didn't find this striking. Nothing differentiated this girl from any other girl. She was normal. There was nothing remarkable, neither good nor bad. But as time went on, I could feel more and more that something was wrong. I don't know how to explain it, but there was something in her eyes that gave me a bad feeling. like. Part of me was screaming that I had to get away from her. Following my instinct, I walked away. To my surprise, she didn't try to keep up with me. I mean, she kept staring at me, but from farther and farther away. I kept running, checking at times to see if she was still behind me. Little by little, the strange girl who couldn't stop staring at me disappeared from my sight. At that moment, that I was scared by a person running and staring at me. But the feeling of danger I had was indescribable. When I walked away, I felt relieved that I avoided something very bad happening. I stayed deep in my thoughts, just running, until suddenly, I bumped into someone. As I turned around, I saw the girl from before behind me, bending down to tie her shoelaces but still looking at me with a big smile on her face. This was weirder than I could handle. This was my last lap. I kept running in the direction of the square door to get out, but I started to feel very dizzy. Without realizing, my leg was burning too. It felt like I had been pricked by something. Within seconds, I couldn't run anymore and fell to the ground. People began to check on me, but I couldn't speak. With a worried voice, the girl approached me, telling everyone that she was my girlfriend and that sometimes I got sick. With unusually great strength, she lifted me onto her shoulders and carried me out of the square. All I could do was babble and resist me. I couldn't feel my body, but I was fully aware of everything that was happening. The girl took me to an apple. I could hear her laughing out loud as she did so, as if she was a kid who had just done a bad thing. <laughs> I guess it's the end of the road. Why? Why? Really? Why? <laughs> this is so hilarious. I don't get it. You don't really think I need an excuse to hurt you, do you? Do you think I have an ulterior motive? <laughs> A vendetta against you. Some evil plan or ritual. You watch too many movies. I don't need any reason to hurt anyone. You're not special either. You weren't the first. You won't be the last. Please don't. She crossed the avenue at a green light, dodging cars that seemed uninterested in the possibility of running her over. You know, before they die, Everyone thinks their death will mean something or be special. That's not what death is. In case you're wondering, your death will be at the hands of a stranger. Someone who wants to hurt you for no reason. You mean nothing to me. And your death will only happen by mere chance. I want you to just think that in the last seconds of your life. 
<laughs> Halfway across the street, she threw me to the ground and ran away. Unable to move, I watched as a car was about to run over me. I swear my life flashed before my eyes. I felt like it was all over in that moment. Luckily, the car reacted in time and moved aside, hitting another car and almost causing a massive accident. From the ground, I watched as the rest of the cars hit or dodged me, while I just tried to move uselessly. Suddenly, I saw an out-of-control car speeding in my direction. I was dead. There was no way I could move in time. But as if it was part of some miracle, another out-of-control car hit it pulling it away from me just as it was about to run me over. At that moment, I realized that the accident was over and the cars had stopped coming. I was safe. The police and ambulance arrived shortly after everything had calmed down. At the hospital, they detected that someone had injected me with a powerful tranquilizer that some people use in zoos. Although I was fine, if that woman had injected me with a larger dose, I could have died. A short time later, the police arrested that woman. Although the cameras had seen her, they couldn't find her until she made the mistake of returning to the same square and doing the same thing. Shortly thereafter, she was arrested for murdering other people. She just confessed. She didn't even try to hide them. Her motives were never known. Whenever anyone asked her, she would only say that she did it because she felt like it. This may sound very strange, and I admit it, it's pretty weird, but I've always had this weird dream of being the chocolate man. I know, it sounds like the dream of a kid who just saw Charlie in the chocolate factory, and it really is. But as I grew up, I always wanted to be like him. Unlike him, I couldn't have a factory and Oompa Loompas working for me but I settled with my little store of handmade chocolates in a shopping mall. Surprisingly, and against all odds, I was doing quite well. Everyone thought it was a bad idea, that there was no way a small chocolate store could work, but I proved them all wrong. In a matter of months, everyone in the mall knew me, and they loved to come in and buy chocolates from me. I always tried to make the weirdest flavored chocolates imaginable, and the demand was so high that I had to start ordering chocolates made by companies. It was a moment of great happiness for me. I was fulfilling my childhood dream, but I was also doing well. But, well, as you can imagine, all good things must come to an end. Although I never imagined that it would end in such a tragic way. It all started on a normal day a day when I woke up thinking that nothing strange would happen. Just restocking the merchandise, serving my regular customers, and selling my chocolates. Everything started exactly like that, until he walked into my store. Liquor chocolate. Do you have any liquor chocolate? I need chocolate with liquor. Oh, hello, sir. Let me see if I have any left. As I was searching and picking up the chocolates, I felt that man looking in my direction. It was strange. I had my back to him, but I could still perceive that his eyes were fixed on me. I felt a shiver with each passing second. Something was not right with this person. The last of the liquor chocolates. Lately, a lot of people are buying them, but I still have these left. With a huge smile and his eyes totally lit up with happiness, the man grabbed all the chocolates and gave me his money. Thank you very much. You are very generous. My girlfriend and I love the chocolates. Oh, are they for your girlfriend? It makes sense. I don't think you'll eat all those chocolates. Yeah, my girlfriend loves chocolates. She could eat chocolates all day long. It makes sense. We all love chocolates. <laughs> I hope you enjoy them. As he was leaving, I must admit I felt a little guilty for judging this man. Yes, his appearance was odd, and the way he spoke was even worse. But he meant well, and honestly seemed like a good person. I felt a little ridiculous for being uncomfortable with him, and just continued to serve my other customers while he happily walked away with his chocolates. From that day on, 
I started seeing the man's face a lot more often. Every week he was waiting at the same spot, always eager to ask me for 15 or 20 chocolates of the same type and flavor. I could never anticipate what he wanted. Sometimes he would ask for mint, sometimes hazelnut, sometimes strawberry or caramel. I could vary the flavors he asked for, but no matter what, he would inevitably show up. Everything was going well until one day, one day, I didn't have enough chocolates. Chocolate man, I want 18 filled chocolate bars. I'm sorry, sir. We were a little short on production this time. I can offer you seven of those chocolates. I could also recommend the mint ones or these ones that are filled with... No! I want the caramel ones. In just a second, his smile vanished. His shout made me think he was angry, but he seemed more puzzled as if my answer had thrown him off. Sir, I'm sorry, but I don't have that many chocolates. But you really should give the rest a try. Your girlfriend will surely like to try more variety. Liar. My girlfriend will be mad. She wants the caramel-filled chocolate. If not, she'll be angry and won't talk to me. I'm sorry, sir. There's nothing I can do about it. Furious, he threw all the chocolates off the shelf and looked back at me in an intimidating manner. If he had tried to scare me, he had failed. I was as angry as he was. What do you think you're doing? Get out of my shop. Now. Chocolate man. I need those chocolates. I need them now. My girlfriend. Do you want me to fight with my girlfriend? Do you want to steal her from me? She is mine. Do you know what it cost me to find her? Sir, I don't know what your problem is, but I'm one second away from calling the police. Get out of my store. No! Liar! I know you have the chocolates. Why are you lying to me? Why are you all lying to me? Furious, he began to choke me with one hand. I tried to defend myself, but... His strength was just enormous. With his other hand, the man opened the cash register next to him and extended with his other hand into it. From there, he pulled out the chocolates I was craving. Liar! Here they are! You wanted them all for yourself, didn't you? You were going to eat all my girlfriend's chocolates. Sir, those are for an order. That's why I didn't offer them to you. The man removed his hand from my neck and I breathed as hard as I could. But the terror wasn't over yet. He was still on top of me, trapping me with his huge body. While I was still trying to react and understand what was happening, my peace was gone in just a second. The man had not stopped choking me to free me, but wanted to use both hands on something else. With one hand he was holding a chocolate bar, and with the other he was ripping off the wrapper. What the hell are you doing? Get off of me! Without any response, my attacker started shoving chocolate into his mouth. He was rubbing the chocolate on his body as if it were a soap in the middle of a shower. His gaze was completely lost, frantic. He was just rubbing more and more chocolate. Suddenly, with his face and body full of chocolate, he stared at me with more chocolate in his hand. I can't describe to you the fear I was feeling at that moment. The man was on top of me, staring at me in the most perverse and cruel way you can imagine. At that moment, I had no idea what he was going to do to me. I knew it was going to be something horrible. And I wasn't wrong. The man put chocolate in his mouth and stared at me. I was frozen with fear. I couldn't move. I'd never been so scared in my life. I'd never been frozen with terror in my life. At that moment, I could have imagined hundreds of things I could have done. But at that moment, none of them came to mind. He, on the other hand, was moving very freely. Do you know what he did after that? He grabbed my mouth with both hands and opened it. 
he approached me slowly and dropped the chewed chocolate from his mouth to mine. I tried to close my mouth, but he was squeezing it so hard with his hands that it felt like it would break my jaw from the force he was applying. I was gagging, and at the same time I wanted to throw up, but because of all the chocolate I had in my mouth, I couldn't. Imagine what I was feeling at that moment, as the chewed and saliva-filled chocolate ran down my throat in just seconds. The man was insane, totally blinded. It was as if he didn't even know what he was doing. He was just enjoying the sadism of torturing me. Suddenly, in the middle of all the bizarre and repulsive moments we were living, a couple entered the store looking for chocolates. As soon as they saw the scene, they quickly pushed the man away who was completely deranged and out of his mind. He didn't put up any resistance. He just stood in the corner, swaying. The next thing I remember was being in the hospital. A nurse met me with a doctor who told me that they'd saved my life by a miracle. I nearly choked on my own vomit, and if the doctors in the ambulance didn't treat me quickly, I wouldn't have made it to the hospital. Soon after, a policeman came to get my statement on what happened that day. My attacker was not the kind person I thought he was, but a kidnapper. He had kidnapped a young girl and held her captive in his house. That girl was his girlfriend. She didn't even like chocolate, but that was all the man gave her to eat. After that day, you can imagine that I had the store closed for a while. But after a few months, I reopened it. I never had a customer like that again, although today I have employees who take care of the store for me. Not because I really needed it, but because I never felt like being alone in that place again. Every time a person I don't know comes in, I get scared, remembering about that man sitting above me, dropping chocolate from his mouth to mine. How many of you have dared to play any forbidden games? You know what I mean. Games where you contact beings that should not be contacted. Games like Bloody Mary. Games like The Cup. Or games like Ouija. I tried to play that game. I could say I was tricked, but I played it anyway. And I have to take responsibility for that. I'm sure you're wondering how I did, right? If you are planning to play it, just let me tell you that my answer will discourage you. Because even though it was successful, it was the worst experience of my life. I will tell you how it happened. It was Saturday afternoon and my friends Emily, Jessica, Rachel, and I were bored at Jessica's house. Her parents were away, so we had the house to ourselves. Emily had brought her cousin Mark and her friend David, so there were six of us in total. After a while of chatting and listening to music, Jessica suggested we try something she had found in her parents' closet, a Ouija board. I admit that I was pretty much in disagreement. I was afraid of all those things, but Emily and Jessica insisted, and they were always the most charismatic of the group. You know, the ones who propose things to do. While Rachel and I ended up accepting their plans, even though we had several doubts about them, and this time was no exception. Anyway. We sat down in the living room, turned off the lights, and lit some candles. The tension was palpable. I knew it was irresponsible, but I would be lying if I didn't tell you that I was also a little curious. We started the game, and as I expected, nothing happened. We asked simple questions, but the board didn't answer. Mark and David started making fun of the game, saying it was a waste of time. To break the monotony, I waved my hands to play a joke on them. I wiggled my fingers to answer their questions. They were excited, but suddenly, everything took a darker turn. I suggested that we say goodbye to the supposed spirit to end the game, but when I moved my fingers to the word goodbye, the board moved to no. Suddenly, my hand began to move on its own. I couldn't control it. My hand was moving too fast. The letters formed nonsense words, and I didn't understand anything that was happening, but I couldn't get my hand out of the game. I panicked, thinking that my friends were moving the board, 
but when I looked at them, I saw that they were terrified. This was not a game. My hand was not controlled by me. There was a rule that says we can't leave the game without saying goodbye to the spirit. So we had no choice but to keep playing. I was scared and angry, so I demanded the spirit to let us go. At first, the board didn't move, but within seconds, something changed. The house was freezing. The candles were flickering and the darkness around us seemed thicker, as if we were surrounded by an all-consuming darkness. My friends were petrified with fear. Suddenly, one of the lit candles flew at me. I could barely dodge it, and when it hit the ground, it ignited with such intensity that it looked like a flamethrower. That's when the fire illuminated for a moment the face of something standing behind it. It was a frightening figure watching us. That thing, whatever it was, had its eyes wide open. I could see it weeping blood. It looked like a statue, but it was definitely a living thing. Then the candle went out, and so did the others. In total darkness, we began to hear footsteps near us. Something stood behind me, and I felt its breath on the back of my neck getting closer and closer. The pressure was unbearable. With each passing second, the atmosphere grew heavier. Emily began to cry, and Mark tried to calm her down, but her voice trembled with fear. What is that? We all turned our heads and saw a tall, thin, motionless shadow watching us. It was the statue-like being again, but its presence was unnatural. It didn't move. It didn't make a sound. It just stood there. But we knew it was alive. We knew that at any moment it would attack us. Jessica tried to turn on a flashlight she had on hand, but even though it was on, it did not illuminate. It was as if the darkness was absorbing all the light. Suddenly, the shadow began to slowly advance toward us. Mark stood up and shouted, Stop playing games, and let's get out of here. But the front door wouldn't budge. It was locked, and there was no way to open it. We tried the windows, but they were also sealed. We were trapped. This can't be happening. It's just a game, isn't it? Nothing can happen. It must be a joke. It can't be real. This isn't a damn game. We have to do something. Now! The shadow was getting closer and closer. We could feel its menacing presence, as if an invisible force was pushing us towards the ground. It was a pressure that started at our spine and squeezed us. We decided to return to the board and ask the spirit what it wanted. What do you want from us? The tablet moved slowly, forming a word. Soul. He said, soul. He wants our soul. We are dead. Before we could understand, the temperature in the room dropped even lower. We could see our breath condensing in the air. The shadow was almost upon us. I felt an icy cold on the back of my neck. As the being passed by me, it felt like my whole life flashed before my eyes. I felt the loneliest, cruelest, most indescribable cold I had ever felt in my life. I fell to the ground and began to vomit from my nerves. My eyes were closing and my chest hurt. I was fainting. It was at that moment that dizzy and disoriented, I realized one thing. The shadow ignored me. When I managed to gather my energy to turn around, I saw the shadow grabbing Emily's face. Suddenly, the being opened its mouth, and unable to control herself, Emily opened hers as well. It was as if an invisible force was manipulating her. From the shadow's mouth, mosquitoes began to emerge. Hundreds, thousands of them, heading straight for Emily. The mosquitoes seemed to consume her, entering her mouth and nose. Emily was in a state of shock, her body convulsing and her eyes rolled back. She fell to the ground, motionless, foaming at the mouth. 
everything quickly returned to normal. The room returned to normal temperature, and we all jumped desperately towards Emily. My first impulse was to put something in her mouth to stop her from biting her tongue. In the meantime, we tried to shake her, to call her, but she was unresponsive. Emily was in a coma. We moved away as fast as we could. It could be that the place was back to normal, but we still had no power and our cell phones didn't work. We met at Rachel's house and called an ambulance for Emily. As we waited, we tried to figure out what had happened. What was that? I don't know, but I think it was just a game. Emily was taken to the hospital, but she never woke up. The doctors found nothing physically wrong with her, but we all knew something had changed. Over the next few weeks, we all experienced nightmares and strange sensations of being watched. In our dreams, we could see Emily in a room, locked in a small cage, crying. Her skin looks decomposed, and her body is ruined, malnourished, and injured. A few months later, Jessica decided to move. Her family could no longer bear the paranormal events in their home. Before she left, she confessed everything. She and Emily had played Ouija two weeks before playing with us. Since that day, something strange had been haunting Emily, who went overboard with the questions she asked and disrespected whoever she had been playing with. The reason they had played with the rest of her friends again without telling them the truth was that Emily wanted to get rid of the shadow that was haunting her. If she couldn't convince her to leave while they played, she would at least pass it on to someone else. That's what the boys were for. Emily never understood that you can't use human reasoning to understand something as complex as what she was going through. And by playing Ouija again, she just called and invited that demon to attack her. Even though she told us the truth, we never forgave Jessica for that betrayal. And eventually, we stopped talking completely. As for Emily, we still see her in our dreams. All dreams are the same, but different. It is as if, instead of sleeping, we were transported to another astral plane, condemned to witness for the rest of our lives how Emily's soul is tortured while her body remains in a coma. <laughs>